And welcome back, everyone, to the Bitcoin Business Bureau. I'm your host, as always, Litecoin Leader. Today, we're continuing our series on the economy, which I titled My Own Personal Theory of Economic Relativity. So far, this is there's been three parts. First, we went over valuation. Second, we went over inflation. And then we went over correlation. Now, uh, Opera Man will be proud, but the fourth installment, which is this one right here, and by the way, the other ones are going to be right up there, but the fourth one is also another shun word, perception. Perception is very important to an economy. Why do you ask? Well, for those who are in charge of setting up the economy, the perception of those that are partaking in that economy needs to be that everything is fine, everything is good, and they are willing participants, and they're more than happy to engage in that economy. Otherwise, they will choose to not participate and find other avenues. Bitcoin. So now we're, we're talking about perception. So how do they control perception? Well, we talked about that in the inflation video. Uh, they, they are announcing, they're, they're putting out there that the current inflation rate is more like five and a half percent, which they say is really high, but they can manage it. They, they will they'll print more money. They'll the, the Federal Reserve is handling things. The Treasury is doing the right things. They will manage that everything will be just fine. Well, according to shadow stats, the inflation is more like 15 percent. And if you've been to the grocery store, the gas station or the lumber yard, just to name a few places, you probably already know that mm, not so much. So the government wants to have everyone perfectly participating in their economy or whatever version they dream up and install and then if they have all the masses involved in it then they can collect all their taxes and just go away there as their happy happy campers with extra money for their running whatever they really want to do with the government but when you start to question some of the narratives that they put forth such as that the economy is perfectly stable or that the the world still views the u.s dollar as if it was still the strongest fiat currency out there which it is but it's still a fiat currency, not backed by anything, has not been backed by gold since 1971. And even then, it was only partially backed. So now that we've completely gone off the gold standard, the petrodollar is starting to implode because we're printing it to infinity. And now other countries are starting to question it as the global reserve currency, which they're not telling you about. But there's documentation out there that says just last year, for the first time since the petrodollar was introduced, more than half of the international settlements, that's transactions between one country and another, were transacted not in the U.S. dollar. That means there is other systems instead of the SWIFT system. They're using the BRICS system, which is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, among other countries. They're settling things in other currencies, either using the yen, the yuan, the ruble, or Bitcoin. And speaking of Bitcoin, they are, that's being used for other transactions for other countries. Uh, we know about with the story with El Salvador. Other countries are doing it to sell their oil, uh, especially coin, uh, countries that have been banned from the SWIFT system. That is how the United States puts sanctions on countries. Those sanctions are done by saying you can no longer participate in the, in the international settlement uh, system that they've, they've adopted with the dollar, the SWIFT system. Well, they just find a way around it now. They use either a different currency or they use cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, which is becoming more and more popular. So the U.S. dollar, the, the U.S. government, you're not going to hear this from the U.S. media, the U.S. government, because they want to con control the narrative that the U.S. dollar is strong. So that statement gets more and more false every day, especially with quantity of easing, which is a very PC way of saying we're printing money to infinity. As you've, as they had more and more, um, first it was the stimulus last year in 2020. Uh, more than once they did that, and now they're printing more money. Um, look for issues to happen by the end of September of 2021, where the fiscal year ends. And they can't make ends meet for the government, so watch for another government shutdown because they don't have the funds. So there's that. Just a quick reminder that nothing in this video is considered financial advice. I am not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Seek out your own advice and do your own diligence. Do your own research. Now, the second perception is that, that the U.S. dollar is strong against other currencies. Just we Normally, you would see that personally if you were traveling to another country, even if it's just Mexico or Canada. But considering th where things are right now, that 
people who aren't crossing borders, at least not legally, uh, they or not easily. There's not a whole lot of foreign exchange going on unless you're in the Forex, the foreign exchange market. You don't see how the U.S. dollar is doing against the euro, the yen, the yuan, the, the pound. You're not watching that type of uh, information, but other countries are. And they're seeing that, again, going back to the number of countries that are not using the dollar to settle international transactions, they're getting out of the U.S. dollar system. So there was a few theories, and I will go into this. The, the fifth and final video will be about some theories and summaries as to where we're headed. And one of those is the dollar milkshake theory is that everybody needs to use the dollar to settle up that with the U.S. Well, that may not be the case. And we'll get to that in the next installment, which will be the final installment, the fifth of the five part series of my theory of economic relativity. So there's one you have to have. The, you have to control the narrative. You have to control the perception that the economy is fine. The U.S. dollar is strong and that you, everybody should be willing to participate in the all phases of the economic system for the U.S. government, including paying your taxes, um, keeping your money in the bank, keeping your money in cash, and anything that would be denominated or, or re referred to predominantly as a U.S. dollar account. Um, not doing so and, and moving money into precious metals or moving into cryptocurrency uh, eliminates the participation of the economy and reduces the perception of the strength of that economy. So that's going to continue. Now, the other way that they continue to do this is by attacking the alternate economy. So the alternate economy, as many of us in the cryptocurrency space know, is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. So there's two ways that they're doing this, um, among others. But the two main ways, first is just linguistics, language. Words are important. So they, they label coins uh, they, as stable coins that are, and these are stable coins. A stable coin is a cryptocurrency that is supposed to be pegged to the US dollar. It's supposed to be as close to the US dollar as possible. Sometimes it's 99 cents, sometimes it's dollar one or dollar two, depending on the relative demand at the time. But for the most part, it is supposed to be a stable um, representation of a US dollar. Well, the very name stable coin implies that the US dollar is stable. It's just in the name. But what if I told you that the US dollar is not stable? It's inflationary. It's actually going losing more and more of its purchasing power every year. If you go back to 1913, they uh, just here's a little math exercise. They, the government wants to do 3% inflation. That's their target every year. So we've had the dollar system since in the Federal Reserve since 1913. So take the number Take 97%, put that into a spreadsheet or calculator, however you want to do it, 0.97, and raise that to the 100th power. That's 0.97 times 100 times. And actually do a few more because you know, we're actually beyond 1913. I'd say 108 times. You're going to find that the number turns out to be less than 4% if you raise 97% to the 108th power. What that represents, that math represents every year, at the year before, you had 97 cents for every dollar you had the year prior because of 3% inflation. 3% doesn't sound like much, but look at 3% erosion over 108 years, and you're down to less than 4% of the original dollar or the original buying power. Conversely, if you take 3%, to put 103 in that same equation and see how it comes out, it's more than 20 times your original purchasing power. So that's the narrative they don't want to tell you. So Stable coins are not so stable because the U.S. dollar is not so stable. And then lastly, the perception of risk. Actual risk versus perceived risk. Stable coins, U.S. dollar, perfectly stable. Is it risky? No, of course not. It's stable. Cryptocurrency, volatile. Prices swinging up and down. It, it goes from 10,000, Bitcoin goes from 10,000 to 50,000 to 30,000. That's incredible volatility. Well, it is and it isn't because you're measuring it in U.S. dollars. If you measured it in actual purchasing power and looked at it year over year, look at the lows of Bitcoin year over year, it continues to increase. And the purchasing power goes up and up and up. Just look at Bitcoin. Originally, a Bitcoin was $1,000 four or five years ago. Now it's $50,000. Now, things obviously have inflated. 
you can't buy the same thing for a thousand dollars back then as you could for fifty thousand dollars. But if you took a thousand dollars and bought mm, bought one Bitcoin back back in say twenty seventeen, that same one thousand dollars would now have fifty thousand dollars of purchasing power. I think you could buy a lot of bread or whatever you needed to buy for fifty thousand dollars. You like that thousand dollars would not buy a car in twenty seventeen. But today, $50,000 would buy you a pretty good car in, in 2021. So that's just an example of the purchasing power. Now, they will claim that that's unstable or that or it's volatile. But again, it comes down to perceived risk versus actual risk. And for those that are savvy, and again, not financial advice, but for those that understand that if you get involved in something where the value is increasing and that the actual risk is really not nearly as what everyone perceives it to be, then you will make it out like a bandit. Now, that is what Michael Saylor sometimes says, is that, that I think he one of the quotes that he says that in order to make 100x on your money, you have to be one of the 1% that is there first before the other 99% figure out that's where your money needs to be. So you can't make 100x investing in Tesla anymore. You can't do it in, in the other FANG stocks. But this, the potential is very much there for cryptocurrency. We've seen it before, and it will probably, most likely, happen again. So perception matters. It matters for the economy. It matters for cryptocurrency. And then lastly, we're going to talk to, on our final installment, part five of five for the theory of economic relativity, my own theory, of a summation. Where are we at? What are some of the theories? And where are we heading? But until then, I'm going to close the drawer on the bureau, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.